let's go ahead and get started. We're going to get uh, in our study, continuing on the fruit of the Spirit. Let's start with a prayer, if you join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to Thee for the rich blessings You continually bestow upon us. We thank Thee for the fresh morning, the, the crisp air. We thank Thee for the opportunity we have to come and join, join together and, and assemble together to study the Word and to uh, worship Thee in truth and spirit. Father, we, we pray that You would bless us in our studies, that we garner much from Thy Word, that we understand clearly what You intend for us. It's in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray. Amen. All right, so, um, good morning. It's a good time to get started. Um, we've been so used to the nice, warm, balmy weather, maybe a bit of a rain, but, but now it's turned more like toward wintry weather, huh? and uh, getting used to that. But it's, this is, yeah, we, we're so used to, in Texas, the weather changing so much. We should be used to this. In fact, I think for me, it's a welcome, welcome change. Um, last week, we began the, the new study called The Fruit of the Spirit. And we were going to study the, 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 the fruit that is related uh, in um, Galatians chapter 5. Um, and as we look at these things, well, we began a, 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 by way of introduction last week with uh, the purpose of the letter to the Galatians in that course, remember that uh, it was to uh, refute the error that the Judaizing teachers were teaching. But also, uh, the, uh, the verses previous to this in the passage of uh, Galatians chapter 5, we looked and, and considered that he was act Paul, in his writing this letter, was contrasting the, the life and the fruit of the Spirit versus the, the life and the fruit or the, the works of the flesh and how they contrasted so radically. And, and it's quite evident. And, and I don't think anybody needs help. Even, even those who are not spiritually minded could recognize those things that Paul related as, as works of the flesh as evil, as sinful. Well, they want to call it sinful, but they certainly see how it would destroy society, destroy relationships, um, destroy the family, all these things. Um, but as he looks to con contrast these things, we now get to what, as he enumerates, different qualities of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and it's, in the scriptures, Jesus uses often, well, and we understand, the, by, their wor by their fruits you will know them, okay? The f we know that, we re relate, the fruits of anything is that what are the results, what are the consequences of, what are the rewards of, of, of whatever it, we're discussing, whether it be the life in this world or life of Christianity. In fact, that's what he's relating now in Galatians 5. But also, uh, Sometimes it's relating to our, our evangelism, how we uh, uh, share the gospel with others. And, and the fruits are related as the, number, the, as the converts who hear the word and, and, and uh, respond to it. Okay? As we look at John chapter 15, it's, it's a necessity of fruit bearing. It's clearly shown in the New Testament. As we look in John uh, chapter 15, in verse 2, well... Actually, verse 1 introduces it. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And he's relating this to, to uh, agriculture. And we all understand if, if a vine's not going to bear any grapes, or, or, uh, or the tree's not going to bear any, any apples or prune, uh, prunes, or, or no, no, not prunes, plums, <laughs> that that what's the good tree good for? We, the farmer will continue to nourish it and fertilize it and water it and, and care for it and tend it and prune those uh, limbs to try to, to, to make it more productive. And if it still doesn't produce anything, what happens? We've got to uproot that tree because it's not bearing any fruit. And so that's what Jesus is relating here. Anyone who doesn't bear fruit will be, uh, uh, will be purged and will bring to, that it may bring more fruit. Um, look at verse 5. Actually, verse 4. <clears throat> Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. <clears throat> he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. 
I'd like to take note that as we look at this, we know he's talking about evangelism. We know he's talking about as we reach out to, to the lost, that the natural consequence is that there will be fruit being born, being born, okay? Bore or whatever. I can't think of the right <laughs> conjugation here. But we know that, that just as a tree naturally produces its fruit, whether it be apples or plums or peaches or whatever, or, or some say apricots, some say apricots, that uh, it will, uh, it just naturally, it's what comes from the tree naturally. And, and it, it requires no more effort for that tree to produce its fruit than not to. And, and, uh, and as, we, as Jesus is relating this, if we remain connected to him, then we'll be fruitful. So as we talk about being connected to him, what does that mean to be connected to Jesus Christ? What is he talking about? Following his example to the Bible. Okay. Following him. All right. Um, what does that require then? In order for us to follow him, what do we have to do? Well, we have to get the knowledge. Okay. And we get that knowledge from pursuing a study. Okay. We, we have our own personal studies. We have the studies that are, that are in, in the assembly here like this. In a, in a classroom environment, and then there's the studying or learning that gets, comes from the, uh, the preaching on, on in the assembly and the worship. Um, but in that, we need to commit ourselves, dedicate ourselves, resolve to follow him, and of course, that, and when we do, we, we study, but also to be connected to him. We need, to, we need communion with him. And I, I don't, let me clarify this. We know we pray to the Father. We pray to the Father through Jesus Christ. He is our mediator. But as we pray to the Father, in that way, we, well, we're, well when, I, when we think of the communion itself, when we commune with Christ, we think of the communion as, as particularly. But as we ponder the scriptures, as we think about what the, what the uh, consequences of the words of our Lord and we ponder, how, what does it relate to our life? And therein we, we begin to, well, I say we begin, we continue to uh, feed ourselves, feed our spirit, so that we, in effect, have communion with the Lord. Not literally sitting down with him and talking with him, but just in that exposure to him, we remain connected to him as, as a vine to the branch. And if we cease to do that, what happens? If we cease to have this close communion in focusing upon his life and how it relates to us and how we should emulate him, if we cease to do that, what happens? We die. We shrivel up. Yeah. Right. Right. And that it's it's a shame because how many people who have obeyed the gospel how many get it? How many realize the necessity, the import of being connected to Christ? And how many give that up because well, they don't think it's important to be here? You know, you know we can look at the book of Hebrews, and we can, we can say, show how, well, when, when the Hebrews writer is discussing, encouraging one another to be here, well, as you see the day approaching, you know, we provoke one another to love good works, and we also... Uh, Encourage them to be to join together that they not uh, forsake the assembling of the saints as, they, as the manner of some is, but rather that they be here. And, and he goes on to talk about the, that uh, here we go. And let us in Hebrews 10:24. In fact, this, could somebody read Hebrews? Actually, 10, 23 through 27. Let us hold fast to the perfection of our hope without bearing, or wavering. For he who promises, or is promised, is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly, of ourselves together, 
as is the manner of some, but exhort one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, therefore no longer remain a sacrifice of a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearing expectation of judgment and fearing indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Okay, so he's saying, he starts off by saying, encourage one another to provoke them to love and good works. And don't forsake the assembling of, the, of yourselves together as some do but rather exhort one another as you see the day approaching, the day being that first day of the week that they assemble together. But then he jumps right in to say, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, what does he mean? What, what happened here? First he's talking about exhorting us to be together and worship together. Then all of a sudden he's talking, talking about sin will, sinning, sinning willfully. He's talking about the same thing. So that when those who forsake the assembling of, together the implication is they're sinning. So we can see that not going to church, if you're a Christian and you're not going to church, it's a sin. I, I, it really comes down to that. I hate to put it in those terms, but that's exactly what he said. I would rather, I'd rather like the idea of let's exhort one another to be here, encouraging one another to be here. But then when we recognize the, the consequence of purposely not being here day, week after week after week, we have, to, we have to recognize, as the Hebrews writer writes, it's sinning willfully. And if we sin willfully like that, there's no more sacrifice for sins. The blood of Christ no longer covers us. Okay, uh, That's pretty harsh. That's pretty harsh. But you know, on the, you consider what is the whole purpose of our assembling together. Yes, we worship God. We worship our Father in heaven. But we encourage one another and we get strength from one another, and we see that it is, it is advantageous and profitable to continue in the Christian walk as we look forward to that day when Christ returns and we will receive that eternal reward, that promise. And so we get that, but how many people reject it, don't realize what they're losing? And then when it comes to this, the, the fact that as they willfully do this week by week, they are engaging in sin. And what do they expect? A fearful looking for of judgment, of fiery indignation. That's what they have to look forward to. Now, we recognize that, but as we come together to encourage one another, that uh, we can stay connected to the, to the branch, okay. or I should say to the vine. If we, as the branches, Christians, stay connected to the, to, to, the, to the vine, we'll continue to prosper. We'll continue to bear fruit. And it won't be hard. It'll come naturally. Um, it will just, like I say, that, that tree that bears fruit, or in this case, the, the vine that bears fruit, the branches that bear fruit, it just follows. It's a natural thing for those vines to bear that fruit. And I'm not saying that we don't put forth any effort to develop our skills and abilities to do that, but we don't need to be afraid of it. We don't need to be afraid of putting ourselves out there before people and just talk about spiritual things. <laughs> it's a natural consequence. When we're spiritually minded, it, it will just follow that our conversations will be spiritual in nature. Um, and, you know, of course I recognize it. We need to be tactful so that we don't become overbearing and burdening burden upon others. That every time they, they see us, they want to shriek away because, oh no, he's going to talk about important questions again. Okay, they won't say important questions. He's going to be he's going to be talking about things that I, I don't like to look at because it's so revealing. It's so uh, challenging. Some people don't want to be challenged like that. But nevertheless, as we see that, that if we remain 
connected to Christ, that we will bear fruit. And he's talking particularly to his disciples, and he's talking particularly about in his giving him the commission to go into all the world to preach the gospel, that this, the natural fruit, is what he's talking about, is the, uh, the spreading of the gospel and many more people coming in and hearing the gospel and responding to it. Okay, look at uh, 2 Peter 1.8. 2 Peter 1, and actually you recall that 2 Peter 1, the, the opening verses, they're talking about the, uh, we will refer to them as the, the uh, Christian virtues, okay? And, uh, and those things that we put forth in effort to add to ourselves and our lives and our character, our, our, our behavior, um, Verse 5, beginning, and beside this, giving all diligence, so there's an effort involved, add to your faith virtue, add to your, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. All these things are things we add to our personal character. Okay. This is not talking about going out and talking to all your friends about the gospel. This is talking about what you do to grow yourself. To grow spiritually, uh, if you if you if it uh, if you will, to remain connected to the vine, to Christ. So as we add these qualities to our lives, and to knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity or love. Now here's the point, in verse eight. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a, in the knowledge, as you were talking about, the, the, in studying the word, remaining connected to the, to the vine, we are, we are growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and that will be fruitful. It will not be unfruitful, but rather it will be fruitful, bring forth fruit. Now, as we consider this, he's talking about personal qualities we we add to ourselves qualities that, that uh, are, should be found in all Christians. And we grow in these abilities to exhibit these qualities. And it's not an act. This is what we become. It's not just an act. Of this. We put forth a happy face. You know, well, I'm a Christian, so therefore I'm happy. No, these are things that we become. And r- resulting in that, we will not be barren nor unfruitful and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we won't be idle, as it were. Okay. Look at verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see it far off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. That's interesting. The fact that one who has obeyed the gospel has been purged of his sins, if he stops there, that I've obeyed the gospel, I'm now a Christian, I have heaven, if he stops just there, this tells me he's forgotten something very important. He's blind and forgotten. Can't see far off. But he's forgotten. So when one obeys the gospel and becomes a Christian, it should follow that I've got work to do on my life, my personality, on my, the, the, the way I treat people, the way I think about things, the way I think about myself and others. I've got work to do. And, and, and working on these to improve myself. You, you're familiar with these self-help books, self-improvement books. Yeah, you know, as we're growing up, certainly we are learning from our parents and, and our brothers and sisters that, that uh, there's a way you treat people. There's a way you, your attitude toward people that um, it's uplifting, upbuilding, and men's relationships, it molds, it it holds us together in love, and there are things that we do and attitudes that we have that separate us, that, that gives us prickly, you know, like, what, what is that fish? That, is it a little fish that when it fills up and it's got all these spines coming off, uh, splines coming off, off the fish? And nobody wants to touch it. It's all prickly, like a porcupine. You touch that and you get, you get snagged with its, uh, whatever, those, those quills. Okay, and they get stuck. That's the way you don't behave. You don't become like a porcupine to fend everybody off, rather, and so we understand that, but more, more pronounced as we become a Christian, 
it, it becomes ever more apparent that those old ways that we may have had that, that pricks people to keep people away from us because we don't want to be bothered, that's not the way we ought to be. We need to be, as he says here, and, and, and adding these virtues to ourselves uh, and as we work on this ourselves. So it's self-help in that way, but it's the way that God wants us to be. Um, okay, so as we consider the fact that the Bible teaches us that we are to be fruitful, and one way to, re- to be fruitful in, in, in affecting others to, to want to seek out Christ as well. And we, as we see here, the qualities that are in us that people see will certainly draw them to find out, what's this all about? Why does this person have a natural, I can't say cheerfulness, a natural joy? And, of course, their, their cheerfulness comes, around, comes with it, but joy, of course, is deeper than merely being happy. Uh, it's, a, it's a, okay, but so, so we can see how that these qualities would draw people. You know, you recognize there are certain people that just draw your attention. You like to be with them. And I don't mean to be shallow, but they make me feel good. They make me feel important. Okay. They make me feel like my thoughts are worthy of consideration. You know. um, and we just, and there are other people, it's like, it's really hard to engage in conversation because everything's so negative. You know. And so we, we recognize that day by day, and certainly we can see that these qualities, that they would certainly attract people that when they see genuine love emanating from us, when they see genuine good attitudes about them, uh, when they perceive that we have a vision that, that, of, uh, that's, that uh, they're more than what can be seen, that is uh, very appealing. Okay. So... Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, verse 22 in particular. Verse 20 through... uh, To finish the thought, verse 23. Verse 20 through 23. Can somebody read that? Romans 6, 20 through 23. (coughs) <coughs> well, when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your free. You have your free unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. So I added that verse 23 because that completes the thought and that uh, recognition that, that when he asks the original question in verse 21, what fruit had he when, uh, then in those things where you are now ashamed? Well, the, the, natural conse- the natural answer is, well, death, because that's the wages of sin. The things I did at, before I was a Christian, the sin I was living in, the sin I was con- continually committing, that... Uh, it only led to death. And that's why he asked the question, why, what fruit did you have? And so, once again, back to the idea that we all bear fruit of one sort or another. Um, and, and Paul's relating, is trying to draw them to understand that the fruit that they had before they were Christian, it led nowhere except death. Okay? But the fruit that we, our lives as Christians yield is everlasting life, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, for the, okay, but, but look at verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and in everlasting life. So there is a fruit, there is a, there is a, a natural consequence, a natural resort of a spiritual life in God and in Christ in that it is holiness. A Christian will set himself apart from the world, become holy because God is holy. He sets himself not to be soiled by the world. You know, James said, pure religion undefiled before God is this, 
to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted by the world. And so as a Christian, we do. And, and consequently, the, the fruit of that life is holiness and the result of that holiness is everlasting life. Um, so we see that the, the import of fruit, okay, and that the Christian is to bear fruit in various ways. And so as we, our present study has to do with the description of each quality of the fruit of the Spirit and the practical implications of bearing these fruits in one's life. Now let's talk about a little bit. We're actually going now to Galatians chapter 5. But as we discuss the, the term that is used here, you know, in the English language, the term fruit is both singular and plural. And as we read this, uh, we see that the, 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 the fruit of the Spirit that Paul enumerates is several it's manifold, okay, various different ways. And so we might come to the conclusion that there are fruits of the Spirit. But I verified it. I looked up in my, in my Greek uh, New Testament, I verified it with the, the Greek lexicon, uh, uh, Thayer's, and verified that that form of that word fruit is singular. He's talking about one fruit. He said, well, there are several different fruits enumerated here. Well, not really. Let's take an apple. It has a color. They can be red, green, or yellow. Okay, but it, uh, one apple will have one color. That's one quality of that one apple. It has an aroma. We can tell it's an apple. Or even sometimes we can, particular, we can dis discern the particular kind of apple it is by the aroma it, it emanates as we put it up. You know, as we're, uh, as we're uh, trying to pick up the best fruit we can from the, at the market. And so, you know, various people have different methods. You squeeze it. You might... You know, whatever you do, sometimes you smell it. Melons you can smell to find out if it's, if it's too ripe or ripe enough or just still green. Okay, very sexy, but it has an aroma, and it has a flavor that we recognize. Of course, we don't know that until we bite into the apple, but these are all qualities of the one apple. It's not like there are multiple apples, but rather it's just one, multiple qualities that are found into one apple. And so I, I look at this, too, as the fruit singular of the spirit there are multiple qualities, different ways that it is exhibited or manifested. Um, that the fruit, the singular fruit of the Holy Spirit is, has, is, uh, has different qualities like we would look at the fruit. Here, okay, but consider uh, Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. If somebody could read Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, you'll recognize this as well. But think about this, and I'll make a point of this in a moment. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, could somebody please read those verses? There is one body and one spirit, even as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is, all, who is over all and through all and in all. Okay. So the point here is that one body, one spirit, is you're called in one hope of your calling. All the ones, in fact, there are the seven ones here, but we notice there's one spirit. And you think as a, if you have one tree, it produces how many different kinds of fruit? One kind of fruit. And so if you have one spirit, how many kinds of fruit will the spirit produce? One kind of, one kind of fruit, but having different qualities. Now turn also to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Could somebody read that, please? By one spirit, we were all baptized in one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into the one, in one spirit. Okay, we're all from the one spirit. We're all born to the one spirit. We all live in the one spirit, okay? And we drink of one spirit. That means we, we are fed with the same food, of the one spirit. So we're fed by the same food. You know, we, we, I use a lot of uh, commentaries in trying to flesh out, as it were, what the scriptures reveal explicitly and implicitly and how it relates it to other things. So I use these uh, tools, these studies that other, other men have done, and they've researched thoughts and, and, and what the extent, and it's amazing the, the depth of the scriptures and how many things really, uh, is so connected. But 
I'm not fed by the concordances. I'm fed by the word of God. That's the one spirit that, that we're fed by. We drink of the one spirit. And so we see that there's one spirit, and our source of nutrition is the one spirit. Our, and, and we're all baptized in the one spirit. Okay, Not by the Holy Spirit, but yet we are baptized into Christ, of course, and in, according to the, the teachings of the Holy Spirit. So as we look at there's one spirit, so too there's only one fruit, but there are different aspects of it. So there's only one spirit which bears one fruit, which exhibits these many qualities. So as we look at the qualities of the fruit of the spirit, as they're enumerated, we see that, but the fruit of the spirit is first love, I'm sorry, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Nine different things that are enumerated here, different ways that the different qualities of the fruit of the Spirit is exhibited. And he makes the, the observation, against such there is no law. There is no law against these things. In fact, what king, what dictator would not like all of his people to have these qualities? Even the most evil dictator in this world would like all his people to have these qualities. A king recognizes the, the prosperity of the kingdom depended upon, well, yes, the goodness of the people, the goodwill, the good intentions, the good work of, of the people. Even, especially in America, we recognize, you know, there, as we look at our, our republic and the Constitution and the, the legislation, uh, if all these things put together, it's, it's a nation of liberty, a nation of freedom, a nation where we are not inhibited or prohibited in so many personal things by our government. In fact, there are things that are enumerated that the U.S. government, the federal government, will not encroach upon because these are natural rights, natural rights that are given mankind not by government, but by our Creator. And so because of that, those rights shall not be infringed. And that's the, that's the basic fundamental idea. But what is it, in order for this to work, what, what do the people have to be? What kind of people must they be? Would they be the kind of people that would take advantage of others, infringe upon their liberties and their rights? Are we, uh, in order for the, the government to recognize and stay out of people's personal lives, people's personal lives have to be such that they don't destroy themselves. And so you have to have a people that is not feeding on each other, tearing each other apart. You have to have good folk. Okay. And you think about, well, Christians, they're good folk, yes. And, and you've, you've heard perhaps that even our own nation was based upon scriptural, upon biblical principles that is found in the Old and New Testament. And it was, it was, it was uh, put together pretty much by God-fearing, God-believing men. I'm not saying they're Christians, but they were God-fearing God. In fact, many, in fact, most of them knew more about the Bible than most of the people today. They were well grounded in the scriptures in the sense that they knew what the Bible said, and they had application for it. You don't believe me? Read Washington's writings. Read many of the other writings of, of the founding fathers, and you'll see how they had the, uh, the principles upon which they had built everything, even... even um, when Washington was dealing with one of the, the uh, native tribes of America, and he was talking to the chief, and he said, one of the most important things you can do for your nation, for your tribe, is to teach them Christianity. Jefferson recognized one of the most important books that could be used in school was the Bible. Not only is there, is there a lot you learn to, to read well, okay, of course it is, uh, uh, it's not the kind of structure of, of uh, the sentencing that we would use, but yet we learn in a thought process, and, we, and one could learn discernment, one could learn discrimination in, in a good sense, and, uh, uh, but also he learns morality, 
he, he learns what God requires of men. Okay. And so at the recognizing that it's a, the necessity of the people to be good, the only, way, the only way that America can work the way it was intended is men are generally behave themselves in such a way that is good. And, and so any nation recognizes when its people reflect and they, they exhibit good qualities, uh, that the nation prospers. It's, okay. All right. Um, and of course, as we reflect on these things and we implement these things in our own lives, in our own attitudes, in our own behavior, we become fruitful for our Father in heaven. Um, any thoughts about that or comments? Yeah, you know, so you've been talking about this and you use the, you know, the imagery of the vine and branches and you think about the parable of the sower and then of those other agricultural images in the Bible. And you think about the key to all of this is to, you know, if you're going to be a a faithful Christian, if you're going to have these these fruits of the Spirit, you you've got to be fed on the Word. And you know the Hebrew writer talks about you know you're still in milk. You need to be in you know you need to be mature. Ephesians writer talks about it. Um, that is so key to all of this. I mean, you can't develop the fruits of the Spirit if you don't have the food to do That's it. Right. With. And so uh, you know when when someone becomes a Christian, the key to their, de to their growth and development, yes, is the fellowship with the body, but, you know, they've got to learn the Word of God. Yes. And not just, you know, a cursory reading of it, because there are a lot of people who say, you know, I read the Bible every day, but they have no depth of understanding at all. And so when you look at, at later on in Ephesians 4, when he talks about these people being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, well, that's why they... That's why they are, is because they don't have the depth of understanding of Scripture. You know, they don't have the, the roots that are going to keep them from being uh, swept away or being choked out by the, you know, the cares of this world, yeah. yeah. So to me, that is, that is so key to, to, to it all, is if you don't know what God is, to, you know, he's given us a word to help us through life. He's given us everything we need. So, you know, if, if we want to improve, if, if we want to develop uh, a greater depth of peace or joy, or, then it's got to be through the Word. There's no other way to do it. Right. That's right. And I think in the brethren, that, that's where the encouragement to keep on keeping on. Yes. Stay in the Word. Mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, and, and if you are, then you're going to do what God's asked you to do. You know, you're going to exhibit the character of, of a devoted Christian, which means you're going to be at the worship service. And so that, I don't know, to me, it may seem simplistic, but to me that is, that's key to it all. Yeah. Yeah. There are various seminars going around, always going around, and you'll hear them advertised on the radio. Uh, you know, and, and, and these days and times, and well, any time, people have been and ought to be interested in their, in their financial welfare and the future of their, fi their finances, and, and they're making right decisions and taking advantage of whatever tools they have available to them. And, and people flock to these things. They come because they know it's going to benefit them. It's, it's a... Uh, it's a, it's a, t a, a I, you know, if they're anything like me, uh, they're, they're uh, financial idiots, okay? Uh, they, they, they're, they don't recognize, and so they realize that, so I need to go somewhere to, to get some training, so I know what to do. And they flock to these things, and they, they for the purpose of it, looking forward to finding the, the, the shall I say, secrets, and they aren't really secrets, but the, the, the information they need so they can make well-educated decisions and benefit them. Okay. Now, 
we look at these qualities of the, of the, of the Christian, the virtues, and that, the, that we're taught to add these to our lives, and what's the result? We'll be fruitful for the Lord. We'll find everlasting life. We'll separate ourselves from this world. We won't be spotted by the world. We'll be clean before God because of the blood of Christ. And, and what richness can we enjoy when having that confidence that we are children, that we are sons of God, and that we have that hope? We're living somewhere out of country. We're living, we're, we're, we're in a foreign land, and we're looking forward to going home where we'll have this rich wealth that we've been promised. And so, given that, by exposing ourselves to these things and, and, and uh, pondering them and reflecting upon them and seeing how they fit and how we need to change so that we can bear fruit for the Father, but yet, who flocks to that? That's all I was trying to do is draw a contrast between people see the value of, of economic opportunities. But when it comes to spiritual opportunities, how many see the wealth of information there? The wealth of experience, the wealth of sharing, the wealth of enjoying the fellowship of true Christians in close union close communion with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And, and, and so it, it's sad, as, I, as I, you know, when you go to Hebrews, as we did earlier, showing that you, you uh, forsake the assembly and you're going to be sinning. Yes, that's true, but that's not what it's about. It's about come and be fed and grow and enjoy the fellowship of the Father and find the richness of the blessings that are found in him. That's, that is a very positive thing. Sometimes people do need to be motivated by the negative. That's why, why did Jesus speak so much on hell and the horrors of hell and the fact that people will be lost in hell. People that think they're saved, they will be saved, they won't be. He's warning them. And, and, and so, so it, I, I just marvel that people don't see the richness of the wealth of, of what God has brought us in his word and the opportunities that, that so many people could have of learning the truth and enjoying the fellowship of those in truth. And that's my soapbox for, for this class this morning. So next week we'll, con we'll continue, we'll discuss the, the first fruit and that is of love. And that's, it is, there's a reason why it was given for first apparently. And there's a lot to be said about love and, and we will as the scriptures reveal it to us. So I appreciate the comments and, and, the, and the questions. And we look forward to seeing you next week.